welcome everybody to this panel discussion. I think it's uh, time to start already. We have uh, our five experts ready to start. And uh, the intention in the next 60 minutes is to speak and uh, openly discuss about the cutting edge topic in intelligent vehicles uh, technologies. Uh, we uh, intend to talk about autonomous driving, the current trends and future perspectives. All right, for this purpose, we have the pleasure to announce our five experts in the fields from different perspectives. Uh, we have the pleasure to count on Juhani Jaskelainen. He is uh, head of uni of the ICT for uh, transport in the Director General Info at the European Commission. He has a large experience in the management of research and development calls in the field of intelligent transportation systems. Next expert is Chris Urmson. You already know him. He was keynote speaker yesterday. He's head of engineering at Google's self-driving car and was the director of technology for the team that won the 2007 DARPA Airbank Challenge. Ralph Herwich is director of driver assistance and chassis systems at Daimler AG, Germany. After 10 years as director for infotainment and telematics, He's now head of driver assistance and chassis systems in charge of conceiving and developing future safety and comfort innovations for Mercedes-Benz. Next one is Christoph Stiller, uh, chair, professor, and director of uh, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and president of the IEEE Intelligent Transportation System Society. He's autonomous dri uh, driving team anyway. Uh, was finalist in the DARPA Airbank Challenge 2007 and winner of the Grand Cooperative Driving Challenge last year in May 2011 in the Netherlands. And the fifth expert is uh, Alberto Brogi, full professor at the Universidad di Parma and chief executive officer of BISLAV. Uh, Alberto was a director of the Argo project, a more than 2,000 uh, kilometers test done on Italian highways in 1998, was participant in the TerraMax team that reached the finish line of the 2005 DARPA Grand Challenge, and director of the Bislav Intercontinental Autonomous Challenge in which uh, uh, two vans drove autonomously from Parma in Italy to Shanghai in China in 2010. Okay, so, let me explain to you very briefly uh, the dynamics that we will follow in the panel. I will make some initial statements introducing the problem, the advantages, the potential benefits, uh, obstacles, problems, uh, opportunities, etc. And then I will give way to the five experts to make their uh, initial statements in three, five minutes each. After that, we will discuss about the open questions that I will pose in my introduction. All right, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the highlights in autonomous driving. As all of you know, there are many potential advantages. Some of them uh, have to do with safety, efficiency, and environmental improvements. This is clear, but there are also some forces against adoption. One is fear. We don't trust a computer driving for us. This is a natural uh, feeling that we all have or might have. And uh, on the other hand, we love uh, driving, or some people love driving. Love of driving can be a force against adoption. Another issue is regulation. A couple of questions come to my mind. For example, should the police officer have the right to, to pull over and issue a ticket to autonomous vehicles? Who is responsible for that? Who pays? And what kind of insurance would these uh, autonomous uh, vehicles need? Um, another proposals have been done in order to push consumer and manufacturer adoption. For example, the, the idea to introduce mandatory compulsory automotive zones or, on drive time or drive times. For example, imagine the San Francisco Bay Bridge in which a, a sign indicates that automotive compulsory from 6 to 10 a.m., for example, something like that, in order to let the car manage autonomously the change from two to six lanes and from six to two again, so on. All right, everybody seems to agree that the revolution will come, but the question is uh, when, how quickly will the revolution come? Other potential hurdles on our way, 
uh, potential obstacles are, for example, the uh, fact that some trivial tasks for human drivers, for human beings, like for example, recognizing a, a police officer or a safety worker, uh, asking the driver to, to move, to proceed, to divert in an alterna alternative direction, can be difficult to recognize for a machine. So this is an issue. And automated systems are still not intelligent enough to invent and attempt new solutions to unforeseen situations. So there is a lot of reasoning issues are still pending, uh, waiting for some breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. All right, this is a more tricky question. Um, human drivers, as you know, we frequently bend the rules in some countries more than in others by rolling through stop signs and driving a little bit uh, above the speed limits and so on. So the question is how would a polite and low abiding robot vehicle fare against such unfair competition? Another question is the following. When we let computers take over difficult tasks, humans get lazy, you know. Humans that used to handle those tasks get less training and gradually lose their skills. And this may derive in a dangerous situation when we, it comes uh, to driving. The potential liabilities are another problem and are a huge barrier for the introduction of this technology unless there are some policy ways around it. For example, compulsory mandated liability exemptions. In the case of machines in medicine, there are some liability exemptions because it is assumed that the benefits are higher than the potential risks. So this is an issue. And finally, a marketing issue. Uh, just an idea, maybe a more consumer-friendly name could help. This is, I insist, a marketing issue, just to, to help introduce uh, these kind of systems in the market and to, to push consumer and manufacturers to, to develop and buy respectively these systems. So, just to finish my initial statements, six open questions for our experts and for the audience. First one is a very trivial one, the question that anyone can, can uh, pose regarding autonomous driving and their introduction in the market. What is the nature of major obstacles, main problems for massive deployment of uh, driverless cars on public roads? Is it technical, commercial, legal, liability, marketing, others? This is an open question. The second one is, which are the technological trends in the field of, uh, in terms of sensors, algorithms, and processing devices? I mean, what is missing? What is left? What is the next step in this uh, area from the technical point of view? Third question, which are the future plans of car manufacturers in this field? Um, very tricky one. Fourth one, what is the role of other stakeholders such as policymakers, technology providers, insurance companies, others. The fifth, I think it's a very interesting one. What kind of new business models can be built around the driverless vehicles industry? I think we have the right, the right partners in this table to, to talk about it. And the sixth one, can we reasonably expect to see economic support to autonomous driving on public bodies like the European Commission, for example, in the form of uh, research and development calls? Or uh, do we consider that everything from the technical point of view is already done and no more research on this uh, area is needed and just it's just a question of uh, market, business, legal, liability issues, etc. All right, so this is the introduction to the topic. I have launched six open questions um, now I, will, I would like to ask our panel members to make their initial statements and uh, in this case I would like to ask Mr. Jaskalainen to be the first uh, representing the European Commission. So, Johanny, would you like? Thank you, thank you Chair, and uh, good, good afternoon. And uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very honored to be part of this very distinguished panel where a lot of the other members have more in-depth knowledge of automation than I do. Now, why I am here, I think it is justified with a couple of things we have been doing, and one of them was a study on automation which we funded last year. It was coordinated by TNO, it's a very good study. 
Also, we organized a workshop last year on uh, automation where we dis were discussing with, let's say, all the European stakeholders the, uh, all the issues concerning automation and legal side standardization and applications and so on. Of course, many of you have uh, participated in some of the action activities. We have funded projects. We studied in FP6. We funded uh, actually something on uh, fully automated vehicles called uh, cybercars. We were funding uh, platooning, chauffeur. And now in FP7, we have funded Have IT, which is, uh, I think, a very important project concerning the future of automation and also interactive and others. Now, uh, our chairman has put a lot of uh, nice questions on the, on the table, and I cannot possibly address all of them, but maybe some comments on, the, on these issues. Now, first of all, I think that the, it is important to keep in mind why do we do this? Why, for example, the European Commission is investing taxpayers' money in this? And I think it's, it's because of the benefits. So we, we are, don't have a full picture of them, but we know that the automation helps both in the road safety and also energy efficiency and so on. It has also been established here during these two days and uh, extensively discussed. Then uh, the second question I think is that where do we actually aim at? And uh, we have to be, of course, careful with the terminology. The, uh, the autonom autonomous vehicle is there in the end of the road, but at the moment we are not uh, uh, going, uh, planning to go full way there. The, uh, automation is not a black and white picture. It is a question about increasing the level of automation in, in the vehicle. And uh, have IT, and it's uh, what we plan to continue, is let's say increasing the level of automation in the vehicle. So we talk, talk about highly automated vehicles. Now the technology path it can be the same, uh, and uh, mo mostly, for example, if you think of sensors, sensors and sensor development, most of this is common, and I think that central side and the building blocks, the, the processing power and so on, we are more or less okay. Uh, so technologies are there. Of course, the cost is an issue if we, we go to mass, de mass deployment. Now, the uh, one thing which I think uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic than the, the, what has been discussed here is the cooperative mobility. And I see, see this as a clear stepping stone towards automation. It's an additional sensor. It adds to the functionality, so we should not forget that it is there, and we, we want to push this forward. Now, the legal side, the, we might come uh, back to this issue of the Vienna Convention in this discussion. I just would like to say that uh, there's a lot of things you we can do without changing the Vienna Convention. The Vienna Convention can be changed. It was changed last in the 2006, when there was an addition saying that uh, the driver should uh, fo not focus on anything else than driving the car and, and so on. But uh, then the, uh, there are some legal issues involved in, the, in that as well. Now, on the legal, legal issues, the, I think the most important from our perspective is the liability. It's getting more complex, and especially when you are talking about service chain, if you talk about community mobility, it gets very complex, and I think that there might be a need for more legislation on, on this side. Then, uh, of course, the, the business models and, and, and so on are also obstacles and so on. Now, uh, if I would... Uh, be asked that what to do next in, in, the, in the research and so on. I think the, I would especially like to point out that the, the, we, uh, we would like to see more work on, let's say, the, uh, the driver the, and the automated function, the car functionality, the interface, HMI, and so on. And also in the issues of uh, the, uh, uh, when there's a mix of automated vehicles and uh, then uh, normal vehicles, how this is going to work, and uh, and uh, uh, how they can uh, uh, can exist in the same same uh, in the transport environment. Okay, I think that these are my initial statements. I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ja uh, just Kleine. May I ask uh, Mr. Ralph Herwitz from Daimler to uh, make their initial statements, please? Yeah. Hello. Good, af good afternoon. Um, there are many questions that were posed to us. As you could see, one of the questions was, what are the major obstacles uh, that we see for autonomous driving? Well, um, I think we'll sooner or later be talking more about the obstacles. Uh, apart from obstacles, there is a big danger that I see, and that is that we fall victim to our own hype. There is 
a very good statement by Arthur C. Clarke, which says that typically the short-term effects of new technologies are overestimated, whereas the long-term effects are underestimated. And I think that is particularly true here. Uh, let's face it, these are great times for autonomous vehicle research, but the great danger is that we all promise too much too soon. Um, so um, that is something that we should all strive to avoid, and I think that is very important to let this field grow and mature, because otherwise what will happen is that we fall short of the expectations that we will raise. Um, if we look at today's systems, and trust me, uh, we've been working on quite a few of them. We've seen our competitors uh, working on a few of them and, uh, and other people here. Um, all of them are great. Uh, still, all of them, uh, and Chris perhaps can talk more on that, have their limitations. And uh, even uh, if we drive uh, hundreds, if not thousands, or 10,000s of kilometers or miles with our vehicles, every once in a while, we see potentially dangerous situations where uh, the vehicle does some misjudgment. Uh, not that it's really dangerous, but that it causes a situation where it would actually be good if the driver resolved that situation. So these issues of robustness make it important for us to think clearly about what we want to put in the market and what we better do not. Now, does that mean that we should wait forever with releasing this technology? Well, I hope not. I don't have enough time for that, so I would like to get this out in the market. And if I want to do this, then there are two roads we can take. One is um, to ask ourselves, in which traffic environments do we want to release the technology? Uh, and to me, uh, apart from very ultra low speed maneuvering applications where I can certainly envision a lot of automation taking place because uh, the effects that you can have are really, really minimal. Uh, apart from that, we can of course think of very controlled traffic situations uh, such as highway driving uh, with fewer degrees of freedom of what can the car do and what can happen to the car while it's going down that path. So uh, we can think of various uh, limitations on that front. Where do we really want to release vehicles? And the other thing is um, we should ask ourselves whether that, um, that mantra of taking the driver out of the loop and uh, giving him something else to do is really the thing that we want to do in the first place. Um, and that, I think, is a very important thing. If we don't do it, then at least for the initial release of the systems that we put into the market, gives us an opportunity sort of to work with a safety net. Um, we can talk more on what it would take to keep the driver in the loop and how safe we can be. I mean, uh, we had seen that, uh, uh, that of course, uh, if the driver gets relieved of certain tasks, then he might naturally turn to other things or might lose some abilities. We'll see to that. Uh, but certainly it provides us with a bit of a safety net, and I think that is something that we carefully have to look at. And this is also why I think that we need to carefully look, and certainly we do this at Daimler, uh, into which elements of autonomous driving we can put into vehicles, perhaps in the form or in the transition of driver assistance systems that we have come to know, uh, and add more autonomous or more autonomy to driver assistance systems still keeping the driver in the loop to see how that works and how the driver can cope with that. And of course, how we as vehicle manufacturers, for example, or as the technology providers for these systems can cope with the situations that then arise. So I think that is a very important line of thought that we all should consider. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Ralph. May we hear Chris' uh, statements, please? You can move the microphone in there, sorry. So, right. uh, thanks very much for inviting me to be part of the panel. It's a great honor to be up here with uh, co-panelists, a lot of fantastic people. Uh, so uh, I was going to talk about three different things uh, in my remarks here. First, just reasserting uh, the fact that it's a, a when, not if kind of question and address some of the large challenges we see in the future for this technology. Um, the second, to talk about how we might deploy the technology initially 
uh, and whether we're actually going to jump to the magic carpet that takes us from A to B, or whether we'll actually have something between here and there. And then finally, to talk about the, uh, the end game and where we see self-driving technology going in the, in the distant future. So turning back to the first topic of when, not if, the, the, the major issues we see are uh, legislative problems, uh, consumer acceptance, insurance and liability, and then the technical challenges. If we take each of those in turn, I think we can, uh, we can check a lot of them off already. Uh, when you look at consumer acceptance, there was a very uh, you know, informal study done of uh, British motorists that 58% uh, of them would find handing over control to a self-driving car um, unacceptable or uncomfortable. Well, that means 42% of the British population already believes that it's okay to hand it over to a self-driving car. That's a pretty good acceptance rate to begin with, and we don't have one yet. So I'm not too worried about consumer acceptance. If someone told me I could have an extra hour a day uh, in my life because I wouldn't have to worry about commuting in the morning, that would actually sell me on it initial, uh, just completely before I even worried about having to wind up uh, and drive on mountain roads. The next is uh, the legislative front. Um, do we need things cleared uh, for us to be able to release the technology? Well, I think that we underestimate the intelligence uh, and responsiveness of our, our governments. Uh, I think that when we show the consumer value for this, uh, we will find ways to get out of the way and make sure uh, as a government that we enable the technology. So uh, the United States, we're seeing this already uh, and we'll expect other places to follow suit as, they, as the technology becomes uh, more mature. Uh, insurance and liability is, is one of these big boogaboos that we talk about. Uh, liability, for one, strikes me as, uh, as a non-issue. Uh, we already have a way to deal with this in the court system. It's called product liability. The system should function as intended uh, and not have been designed maliciously. Uh, and if not, then you know there, there's a remedy that people can take. Do I believe that it would be beneficial for there to be legislation that would limit this in the same way that airlines and medical equipment uh, manufacturers have? Absolutely. Uh, but um, it's not a blocker to entry, it's just something that will ease adoption over time. When it comes to insurance, by the time we're ready to release this technology, we're going to have a story about the safety of it and the process we put through the, uh, the technology through to understand uh, how reliable it is, that insurance companies will, will love that. Uh, furthermore, the, the data, the quality of information they will be able to pull from these vehicles after an incident occurs to recover who was at fault, what the cause of the action was, will actually drive insurance costs down. You know, we'll be able to take that, that evil class of people we call lawyers out of the mix because the data is just there. We'll know what happened, we'll be able to resolve these issues directly. So I think from an insurance point of view, <coughs> it's not that big a deal. Uh, finally, from the technical point of view, well, you know, yeah, there, there's some problems. Primarily, it's in the areas of reliability and robustness, but having spent days here at the conference, knowing my uh, collaborators, knowing the, the fantastic people that are working on this problem, you know, that's something we can solve, and shame on us if we don't. So I think all of that, I, you know, for me, I look at this as very optimistic, that we have an awful lot of these kind of long-term concerns out of the way already. So turning to deployment, um, uh, I completely agree that we're probably not going to launch a car that, you know, on the freeway, 70 miles an hour with nobody in it tomorrow. That's, that's not going to happen. You know, we make, commercial, uh, we make personal vehicles for people to get from point A to point B. So there'll be people in the vehicles uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and so we should leverage those people where appropriate. What I think is critical, though, in that first rollout is that we make a paradigm switch in our thinking. Uh, today, we design active safety systems with the understanding that they should not, uh, that they can count on a person and that if they, you know, if they fail, that a person is there immediately as their safety net. Uh, I believe that we should be uh, marking these things responsibly and, uh, and figuring out how to involve the customer, but we need to make that mental step that the vehicle must respond and that we can't really accept false positives or uh, false negatives. Uh, so I think that's a big deal. Uh, and uh, I think a, a great thing to, you know, kind of the, the, the perfect analogy here is that uh, this expression that the perfect is the enemy of the good, that if we really do wait to the point that we have a purely self-driving vehicle that can go from my door to my grandma's house, you know, we're, we're going to be waiting a very long time. There's an awful lot of lives we can save and time we can return to people in the interim. So uh, I see deployment being incremental. And then finally, with regards to the end game, I, I believe that where we're going to end up is transportation will become service. We're already starting to see the, the beginning of this with services like Zipcar, where people use the transportation and can call upon transportation on demand. Uh, 
Uh, we've put an, invested an awful lot of energy as a culture into moving away from hydrocarbons. Uh, the problem is that you know it's kind of hard. Uh, where I can fuel my vehicle in five minutes uh, with gasoline, fueling it with uh, the same amount of energy into the car with a battery takes a day. Uh, so what I would really like is a car that shows up at my door when I need to go somewhere that's charged, and I don't have to be burdened with the fact that it's charging. When I want to drive just myself to work in the morning, it'd be great if I was using the energy and volume on the roads of a single-seater vehicle, and when I need to take my kids to soccer, that I get a larger vehicle for them. And as a consumer, I would, you know, I would see a cheaper uh, transportation solution than owning a vehicle. So in the very distant future, I imagine transportation on a service w as a service where it shows up uh, is, uh, is where this is all going. So I think that's uh, uh, pretty exciting. I'd like to, you know, I had written down on my page here something about the, the statement about overestimating technology in the short term and underestimating in the long term. So I had to scratch that out a little bit. But you know, my point really was that uh, it's easy to prognosticate today about uh, where this technology is going, but we're going to be completely wrong. What we really need to do is take the first step in getting self-driving cars into the hands of consumers, and then it'll become clear where we need to go from there. So thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. It's time for uh, Professor Alberto Brogi, please. Uh, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, well, <coughs> instead of just giving a statement, I would like to uh, put more um, noise or maybe more energy uh, in, the, in the following discussion by um, highlighting a, a uh, consideration that actually you, Miguel, uh, I guess uh, you missed in the, in the first uh, presentation, actually which is coming uh, more and more um, um, evident uh, as, as time goes by and as the, as the autonomous driving systems progress. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I would really like to start saying that I'm really uh, convinced that uh, in, I don't know when, but we will have autonomous cars driving around, I'm, I'm really sure about that. I'm, I'm not sure when, but, but I'm sure it will happen. Uh, uh, but actually, having said that, um, you may have been, um, you know, maybe nice to consider also that there might be other problems that, that like the one that you mentioned, and that was, um, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, you, suppose you're, you're driving in your uh, brand new autonomous car, um, you, you type in your destination and, and the vehicle just moves, um, and, and while the vehicle is driving and you're not actually taking care about the driving, uh, while the vehicle is driving, a sudden obstacle appear. And, and, and the, the vehicle locates the obstacle, understand there's an obstacle, um, and then the vehicle has to take a decision about that. So the decision would be either braking and, and brake in front of the, of, the, of the obstacle, or maybe having a you know, maneuver to avoid the obstacle, and that could be maybe change the lane or, or maybe I'll go off-road. And, and while the vehicle takes this decision, it will be taking a decision based on some information. And maybe, uh, you know, that if you're going to break, you're not going to break uh, and, and do not touch the obstacle. You, you will hit the obstacle. So uh, maybe that it's better to break and instead of just going off-road because it will kill you or, or maybe going on the other lane because that, the other traffic will kill you. So the vehicle would be you know, deciding that it's better to brake and maybe hit the obstacle at a lower speed. Um, so that, that's reasonable, but uh, if you think that the obstacle could be you know, three kids uh, crossing the road, uh, then the vehicle should be taking a very serious decision about whether to kill three kids or, or kill yourself. Um, so th that's that's really difficult to understand. You know, if you if you look at that from a, from a distance, uh, well, generally you would say that well, killing one, killing three, well, it's better to kill one instead of three. Um, but I d I'm not sure that the the, the 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 buyer of the vehicle, the owner of the vehicle, will be actually happy with that decision. Um, so that's, that's another aspect that, um, well, we should take care about. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alberto. Just a minor comment regarding your, your uh, statement. Uh, as far as I know, there's some European projects going on around that issue, and I had a personal experience to be a reviewer to one of them in which the technical problem was to try to make decisions. The decision, make, um, decision making is uh, an issue, of course, and one of the situations was 
to decide whether to brake, to avoid, or to hit the preceding vehicle in the center because it mitigates the effect of the accident, it's actually in the line that you're pointing. If you, uh, move, move, if you do a maneuver just to hit the preceding vehicle in the center, the effect of the impact is minimized according to the sound accident analysis. So I agree completely with you in this. There is still a lot of research in that area that in principle might seem obvious, but it is not obvious at all. Thank you for your comments, Alberto, and now it's time for Christoph Stiller. Okay. Thank you and good afternoon. It's my pleasure and honor to be here in the um, um, podium. And I'm also absolutely convinced that I will personally witness automated cars um, in the market and will be driving in one that I bought myself. Um, I have no doubt for that. The main hurdle that I see that we have to overcome is purely technical nature. We're just beyond all the progresses that, that have been made in the recent years and which I'm ex excited about, beyond all that, uh, we're just not able to drive autonomously in an unsupervised way such that we could give um, the responsibility for driving in today's public traffic um, um, to a machine right now. We're not that far, even though we will be reaching that point. Um, all the other issues, legal issues, user acceptance, um, marketing, um, prices, cost for the, for the system will be solved once we have solved the technical issue. So my, my um, deep belief is that it's engineers who are, who are asked now to um, bring up a solution um, to that, uh, which will not be that easy. And I also have full confidence in politicians and um, lawyers, at least in this point, that once... <laughs> good <laughs> remark, <we> good <laughs> remark. <laughs> that once we have reached the um, technical solution to um, save lives, to drive much safer than um, traffic is today with a machine, that then this machine will be allowed to save those lives. Um, the user acceptance may, particularly in the beginning, be such that the user is still allowed to drive if he wants to, so he has the option to drive autonomously or by himself as long as he drives safe when he brings a kind of critical situation so that it threatens um, um, let's say to run over a pedestrian or to come in a situation um, like Alberto has just said that just before this happens um, there will be emergency maneuver the vehicle will take over and uh, over control and pass control back to the driver after the vehicle stopped and the situation um, is safe again. Um, the main driver for why I believe this will be coming um, is safety and traffic flow, both. So we are seeing uh, trends of urbanization. We are seeing that in many countries, um, traffic is, will, is already collapsed or is just about to be collapsing. Mobility in an aging society becomes more and more important. And um, therefore, I think that traffic flow and, of course, safety um, is just important. Um, I always think if in, in safety issues, if a smart engineer would come today to his boss um, and the car would not exist right now, and he would say, well, look, I have a great invention. It brings individual mobility to everybody. You can drive from home to the place where you want to go, even far distances for reasonable cost. Just few small disadvantages uh, that it makes some noise um, pollutes the environment, uses some resources, and well, we also have about one million um, fatal accidents a year. And the boss would say, well, wh what are you talking about? We'll, I would not believe that anybody would dare to invent the automobile um, today and bring it into the market under these circumstances. We have just accepted um, these disadvantages as a price for individual mobility and it's time um, that engineers actually find a solution to um, decrease that cost that we have and actually every year um, the amount of deaths people at least in the industrial nations um, is decreasing fortunately. Um, some other things are that automated vehicles will be much better than um, human driven vehicles in the long term in terms of um, accidents and also in terms of smooth traffic flow. The reason is 
um, automated vehicles um, will make faster decisions, as Dario Gabriela um, indicated um, this morning in his um, plenary, and also um, they will do cooperative driving. So I believe that um, automated driving and cooperative driving will come more or less together. We will not have complete automated vehicles that are not yet cooperative. I think the, those two trends will um, run together. Um, and then there's public interest, of course, save lives um, and increase safety, increase traffic flow. So that's why I believe that we'll also have public involvement, the public demand, um, maybe even legislation to introduce such vehicles. But the introduction of such technology will not be a revolution. I believe at least for the next 10, maybe 20 years, it will be a migration where car manufacturers bring more and more um, automated um, functions into the vehicle, but um, the vehicle still require a driver for many situations. Challenges, just to, to close from a technical point of view, uh, in particular in scene perception. Um, we've seen a lot on this conference uh, about improvements in scene perception, but I think most will agree that there's still some way to go before we can really perceive traffic scenes in a, in a quality like human drivers can do that. And the second major issue that I see is decision making, automated decision making. Roberto has already indicated a very critical dilemma situation that could occur. But even in normal situations, decision making is something that um, we need to work on. Um, and after these and some other challenges are solved, um, I have no doubt in the long term we'll see automated vehicles um, in our market. Yes. Okay, thank you, excellent. We've heard uh, the initial statements of our experts. So in this point, we're going to open the discussion to the audience. So uh, I invite anyone in the audience to launch a first question to our experts and start a uh, cross discussion. Anyone in the audience over there? Uh, please, this micro, come in. Uh, Probably the, the first question is uh, addressed to, to, uh, to Ralph or, or, or to Chris. I mean, that uh, uh, Ralph said something that was uh, very important. I mean, that, uh, that said perhaps the introduction of uh, the systems will be in a form of uh, driving assistance or some uh, uh, assisted automation. Uh, one of the problems that uh, we are facing with autonomous systems, especially, I mean, that I'm working in mining and all those things, is that uh, it has been, I mean, that uh, a challenge to implement uh, autonomous systems. And today we can implement autonomous systems when we only have autonomous systems. Okay. The moment that uh, we mix uh, people or non autonomous uh, system with autonomous system, we have we increase the complexity uh, uh, by various or orders of uh, magnitude because uh, people are very unpredictable, okay? So the big question is that uh, 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 human beings uh, spend, I mean, that they uh, have evolved, uh, evolved very quickly. I mean, they learn a lot. How can we guarantee that uh, these systems, I mean, that they will have the learning capabilities in order to handle different human behaviors in a safety manner. Okay, so I would like to know uh, uh, what is your opinion about that and perhaps answer the fundamental question if we can eventually make, uh, independent of perception capabilities that these things are going to improve uh, dramatically, but uh, uh, can we make uh, machines that uh, can learn new behaviors, I mean, that the uh, new behaviors that people are going to have and be uh, uh, safe enough, you know, to uh, uh, let them uh, operate uh, uh, completely autonomous. Okay, the question is clear. Um. Uh, you want to start? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keeps going off. So, um, 
I think if we start building autonomous cars, uh, we cannot assume that we can switch on any major scale to full automation. And I would actually make a distinction between autonomous cars and traffic automation, as you were alluding to. I don't believe in that full-scale traffic automation in a general sense, unless we have some very restricted areas like stretches on air, airport transport or these things where, where things are happening today. Um, so more or less what I think that our vehicles, if they drive autonomously, have to cope with the general situation on the road. Um, and of course, at least as far as I'm concerned, that will make the, um, the application uh, of those vehicles restricted to certain sorts of traffic. Like we've, we've seen the example from India uh, today. I, I currently, I don't know if other people here have other plans, but I do not plan on releasing any of our vehicles autonomously on either India or, Chine, uh, or China. Yeah, it seems to be um, an even more complicated traffic situation uh, so, to be on the safer side, I'd rather use Europe uh, and the U.S. Um, but in those markets, I think uh, we have to cope with those situations. Uh, and actually, our autonomous vehicles, in a way, uh, will more or less mimic um, naturalistic driving behavior, um, if we call it this way. Um, and you had an example in Chris's talk where actually you had to do some, some things like, like sort of pushing yourself into an intersection in order to actually uh, be able to drive and to cope with the uh, uh, traffic situation. And that can actually be something uh, that our vehicles can learn uh, from driver's behavior. Um, Apart from that, I see many applications for, for learning in the vehicle. I mean, uh, and it comes, uh, um, we, we do not need to go to, to full-scale autonomy for that. Um, my feeling is that if you drive on a stretch of road you have never driven before, you drive differently uh, compared to, let's say, your commute drive that you drive every day. Um, you know what to expect, and that makes all the difference. Um, and the same is true for our vehicles and through maps and whatever we have, we actually give our autonomous vehicles some sense of what's coming. Uh, and of course, they can learn over time and can add to that database. So uh, yes, I'm all for learning vehicles uh, in terms of data collection and then adjusting the behavior. But I'll let, let, leave it to Chris to take it from here. So I, I think I'd echo a lot of what, what Ralph said. Um, just, just first though, I think actually India may not be too bad to launch in because my understanding is they're very rational. You know, you have the biggest vehicle, you get out of the way for it. So I think it actually may be a simpler environment. <laughs> uh, anyway, no. Uh, so in all seriousness, no, I, th I think that in the, in the same kind of um, notion that we would uh, roll out features incrementally to vehicles, there, there's no reason that we would have to launch the same features internationally everywhere that there may be places where we, you know, where people drive more reasonably, more rationally, more easily for the, the system to understand, and we would launch in those areas first, I would imagine. Um, you, you asked a really good question about learning, uh, and I think there, learning is one of these things that can mean anything from the integration, the, integra the integrator in a PID loop through, you know, some very, very deep uh, learning. Um, I am hesitant about, you know, having kind of you know, true AI kind of learning in a vehicle because, well, we can't do that. Uh, and, you know, I, I have a, a son who's eight. That means he drives in eight years, and I, I don't have time for us to solve the, the real AI problem. So I think, you know, we, we need to do uh, something a little somewhere between here and there. Um, I think that there's real value in collecting data. The, the way we look at the mapping that we're doing is that we are, you know, providing the, the, the prior model of the road uh, and the, the geometry of the road to the vehicle, uh, as Ralph said. And there's no reason that we can't augment that with, with other data. Um, the average traffic speed here versus the posted traffic speed, uh, the probability that someone pulls out of this uh, driveway versus that driveway, uh, the rate of collisions in this, in this accident. So by, by taking all of this data and collapsing it, we can actually provide the vehicles with much more insight into the, op uh, the environment they're operating in than, uh, than you know, humans do because they'll be able to share this information between the vehicles. So I think there's a lot of value in, in kind of learning, but not necessarily the, the hard AI kind of learning. Okay, 
At this point, I would like to uh, ask a question to uh, two of the members of our panel. Alberto or Christoph, uh, from your technical point of view, what do you think about the following? I go back to one of the initial statements that I did. Imagine a, a car, you know, a car is uh, driven by a, a computer that is absolutely patient, absolutely polite, and can be waiting forever at a four-way intersection because no one else is uh, coming to a stop or giving way to the robot. So can or must we program a robot to be more aggressive or can uh, a computer learn to be more aggressive depending on the situation? What, do you, what is your technical and ethical opinion about that? Anyone? Yeah, actually, this is something that I've been uh, talking with Chris uh, like maybe <laughs> a few hours before this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, this is a, a huge, huge um, problem. I, I'm, I'm not sure we really need to behave like uh, human drivers do. I mean, if you really need to hit the road uh, and mix with, uh, with the normal traffic, maybe, yeah, you need to make yourself known that you are a robot, I guess. Uh, but I, I don't think you need, really need to uh, misbehave. Uh, otherwise, you will be causing, you know, maybe more problems that, than, than a human driver. Good, Christoph. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, be, I know many experiments from Sweden and Holland where um, they have proven that misbehaving um, um, vehicles, like vehicles speeding on a ring around Amsterdam uh, uh, or um, vehicles speeding in Sweden, were actually slower in traveling time and total traveling time than vehicles just driving exactly um, on the limit. And of course, for traffic flow harm for harmonization. Um, some um, group compliance um, helps all. But I think if needed, uh, group compliance can be learned even from an automated vehicle in a safe way. It, it would not be um, an, a vehicle disobeying traffic rules in a strong way, but just maybe taking small things like, like, like pushing into a, um, an a four-way um, crossing, um, as Chris um, has explained in his plenary. Okay, thank you. A quick question about regulation before going back to the public, to the audience. Uh, as you know, Nevada became the first uh, American state to legalize driverless vehicles last year. Similar laws have been, uh, to my knowledge, been introduced before legislatures in Florida and Hawaii and are said to be introduced very soon in California. This is what I've heard. So. Uh, how do we see this issue in the, in Europe? I mean, uh, for example, Johanny, can you give us your, uh, can you foresee, how do you see the introduction of uh, this uh, kind of legislation in European countries, what, uh, I mean, bureaucracy and the philosophy, cultural differences may be an obstacle. What do you think about that, please? Yes, the, first of all, I was uh, very pleased to hear from Chris that the liability is not an issue. And, uh, for example, in your previous question, that uh, if you tell the, uh, the, the computer of the automated car to disobey the traffic rules, you might come in up in the, with some liability issues. Now, the, concerning the legislation, uh, of course, the, as I said, the, we would like the automation to, to, to take off and uh, to be deployed in Europe and so on. But uh, especially in this situation where we are now, the, uh, obviously it's very clear that uh, we are not intending to regulate anything which is not needed. So we, we, we are there to help. So if there's something which we need, we need to do, then we, we are ready to do it and uh, so on. Uh, but uh, the not to, f to force anyone uh, to, you know, on technology-wise or, or let's say on the other side of the regulation. Now, uh, the, uh, on this, uh, uh, issue of uh, 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 let's let's say uh, how the market markets could uh, could take up. I think that as I said, the uh, there's a lot of things we can do without changing the existing regulation and, and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions from the audience over there. We have some. Yes, you uh, in your opening comments you spoke of a lot of different issues for the advent of automation. Uh, it seems to me, and tell me if you agree, that the technological part can be handled by the individual car companies in moving towards the uh, introductions. And 
um, but there's a variety of non-technical issues, so I'm curious to know your thoughts as to whether you see a need for collaboration across the industry in some way, and if so, what would the key topics be? How might that be structured, for instance? Anyone? <laughs> no. Well, well, well. Christians? All right, anyone in the audience want to? Want to contribute to providing a response to, to Richard? Well, I think we have an open question hanging in the air. So. Uh, question, open question number seven, I take note. All right. Um, more questions? Uh, well, let, me, let, let me put it this way. Typically, Dick, when you ask a question, you typically also know the answer to that. So what would be your answer? <laughs> Good answer. All right. <laughs> No, actually, I, I, <laughs> thanks, Ralph, for that. I, 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 I'm really asking a lot of people that question to see if there's some, some uh, energy, some motivation to work across the industry. For instance, the Response Project in Europe several years ago helped with uh, driver assistance, assistance systems in legal issues. I wonder if something like that would be useful now um, for autonomy. And it, it seems to be a more fertile ground to do that in Europe than in the U.S., just the way the government funding is structured and such. So that's at least one example. Any comments on that? Okay, and since I put you on the spot here, I answer that. Um, actually, I think you really have a good point there. Uh, we had a good tradition of when it came to driver uh, assistance systems to go through various rounds of the response program, which were aimed at clarifying uh, what you had to do as an OEM to put such systems into the market. Uh, and we have worked on that among the OEMs and we have worked on that together with the certification authorities. And I think something of that sort is going on, uh, at least in Germany, on a national level right now and I think in other countries as well. And if you take the US legislation in there, which is happening throughout the states, uh, that is, I think, pretty much along the same lines. So that could actually become um, a good framework or a good starting point for generating the, the same kind of legal framework for Europe, I'd say. Okay, Christoph, want to add something? I, I would like to add at least one technical point as, as well. And I, I believe that um, um, cooperativity among vehicles is something where um, stakeholders have to work together to define how can, how can you trust information coming from others, how can you plan collectively, um, cooperatively trajectories such that you're not always the loser or the most greedy one always is a winner, but that you really get traffic done in a cooperative and trustworthy way. Yeah, the cooperative uh, topic is a quite an important one. If you drive uh, an ACC equipped vehicle, depends on uh, whether it is cooperative or not, the feeling of safety is quite different. You can keep a short time gap if it is cooperative, for example. Yes, Johanny? Yeah. And maybe just to add that uh, I fully agree that the, uh, the, uh, the cooperative mobility or connected mobility is a stepping stone towards automation. And in that, uh, especially, we have very extensive cooperation with the US and also to, uh, with Japan and to some extent with China. So we have an EU-US task force which is developing the, let's say, globally harmonized uh, communications architecture so the US vehicle can talk to the European vehicle and so on. And uh, the, you, I would like to invite you, for example, to in Vienna in October in ITS World Congress where you see, see a live demo on how this works in practice. So, the, so in this, this we have the work together, not in automation yet. We, uh, I think that the, it will be very useful, especially for, for example, in exchanging data of, of uh, field tests and so on, which cost a lot of money, as we do to some, ex some extent on FOTs at the moment on computer mobility. Okay, another question for the audience, please. Yeah. Thank you. My, my name is Fauzin Ashashibi. I'm from India, France. Well, my question is, of course, uh, somehow 
provocative, especially for uh, Richard. It's about uh, driverless uh, vehicles. My question, uh, I would like first to make the analogy with aeronautics and uh, mobile robotics. Uh, do you think that uh, if we compare uh, driverless, uh, driverless vehicles, do you think that we can reach the security uh, level that we have in aeronautics? Do you think that uh, today, tomorrow, at the mid-range, we are able to deal with the uh, fault tolerance and to reach redundancy that we have in aeronautics? When I look at the systems, best systems that we have today, uh, they are at best at half the way, at the half the way from full autonomy. Um, so this is one thing to point at, and <laughs> the second thing, is that when we remember what happened in uh, mobile robotics, espe especially uh, for uh, planet exploration. I still remember in the 70s and in the 80s when people were designing these huge robots with multiple legs or uh, the huge nav labs and things like that because we wanted to explore and to discover and build maps, etc., etc. And when we look at what happened at the end, the type of robot that was sent to March, it was just a single function or a single task robot. So my question, do we really need driverless vehicles or do we really need uh, very uh, or highly intelligent vehicles? Vehicles that integrate hundreds of functions, dozens of fun functions, uh, ACC, stop and go, uh, curve warning systems, uh, I don't know, intersection, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I'm not sure that if you ask anyone to buy a Porsche or a Ferrari and tell him it will be driverless, who would accept to buy it? And, um, <laughs> and another thing, I'm, I'm not sure that if you ask a um, car manufacturer if you would like to put a $100,000 uh, Velodyne on it, would be happy with that. We are, all of them would l are now asking us to reduce costs, to reduce space. So what is the solution? It's a very good question. Let me say that the driverless Ferrari is a thing, something that <laughs> should not be allowed at any means. OK. Uh, uh, anyone want to? Yeah. Please, please, Chris. So, uh, do you own a horse? Uh, you know, at, at a point that was the way we got around, and it was inconceivable we moved past that. So, so I, I agree that uh, you know there, there's uh, a long way to go from where we are today uh, to where we're going. Um, you know, I also agree that a driverless Ferrari would be a complete waste. That's not the point of a Ferrari. I, I, I heard I, I met with some folks from Ferrari at one point, and they told me the point of a Ferrari is to go from A to A. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a transportation device, it's an experience. Um, and so, you know, automating a Ferrari, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, so, so you asked about two topics. You asked about reliability and comparing that to aeronautic reliability and safety, and you asked about capability versus, uh, you know, simple uh, pathfinder kind of capability in the, in the mobile robot world. I think the second one is going to be dictated by the consumer. Um, that today we have uh, much more capable uh, vehicles from, uh, from Daimler, from, from all of the OEMs that have you know, an awful lot of capability baked into them and we're already releasing the, the kind of pathfinder equivalent of the, uh, the self-driving car. Um, when we talk about reliability, the answer is that we'll have to achieve the necessary reliability. Uh, do we need to achieve the same reliability that, uh, that a 747 has? Uh, probably not just because you know, the, the risks are different. The space is more complicated though. Uh, you know, the, once you get up into the air, uh, there's not as much stuff to hit uh, as when you're moving around on the ground. So it's, it's a different problem. It's a different kind of reliability that's gonna be called for it. And, and really we're, we're looking at kind of a safety assessment there. So, um, so no, we don't, we're, we don't have the reliability or safety record on the vehicles today, uh, but we need to get there and we will. Uh, and yes, we're going to release incremental features along the way, they're already out there. And the question is, do we have the, uh, the will to go to the next step uh, and kind of uh, <coughs> revolutionize the transportation experience? Okay, thank you. Well, um, um, uh, Miguel. Yes? Oh, well, I'm okay. here. Okay, <laughs> right. 
Well, I just wanted to give a quick answer, but I think I will elaborate a little more, a little bit more on that. Actually, if you do not, do not put any time limit, I guess everybody would be convinced that the answer would be yes. I mean, to your first question, I mean, there will be autonomous uh, system will be uh, very reliable, definitely. If you do not put time limits, if you do put time limits, so you say, well, there will be autonomous driving in maybe ten years or something. Well, that's that's a different question. And I'll tell you a, a, an interesting story. Actually, um, yesterday we had a, uh, a very nice talk from, from Chris. And at the very end, he mentioned that, um, well, they are using laser technology. Uh, they are just not using any vision. Well, just a little bit of vision, but, but they are primarily based on, on laser. And uh, actually, I've been talking to many of the guys in the audience, uh, Uwe, um, Sergio, Dario, and well, they are really uh, very focused on, on stereo vision. Uh, I've been talking to um, other people. Um, Gideon, actually, he's really focused on monocular vision. And, and everybody says that well, actually they, this is the breaking technology. I mean, the real, the real solution to the problems. So that make, makes me think that actually we are not there yet. We still have something to do. <coughs> Yeah, good comment. Another uh, question? We have one here in the second row. Uh, I was yeah, just, we have been focusing a lot of things on the negative things and, and, the, and, the, and the threats they, this technology can bring. And I would want to s see if we maybe for the look at the way of promoting it also. I mean, focus on the positive effects. Uh, and it's easier to judge the potential negative effects if you also understand the potential effects, the positive potential effects. Uh, Professor Stillen mentioned the traffic calming effects, if I can mention like that thing. I mean, it would, would have a traffic safety effect. Uh, I know if I drive on ACC, I drive more, shall I call it more, more safely, less aggressive, because it's more comfortable to drive with ACC and keep the pace of the traffic. I, uh, and I assume that uh, with more autonomous vehicles on the road, that people will try to accommodate into that pace, <coughs> and therefore we would have an overall safety effect. They would be kind of like a model also to that. So then the ne next issue comes, how would we be able to assess this effect? I mean, you can talk about it in a phil philosophical term, but how do we actually get to try to put some numbers on it? Of course, it's difficult to make exact numbers, but it's always easier to discuss an issue when you can quantify it. And how would we do that? Is it a comment or a question? A comment? I, I thought this was a question to the audience. How, how would we go about to promote the positive or, or to assess the positive effects in order to promote the technology? Right, it's an open question. We have another open question. Yeah, there. So until now, what we are doing is to try to develop some technology to assist the human driver. So how about the, some technology to prevent a human driver's crazy behavior? And uh, some, if there are more and more autonomous vehicles. So if we can put some, for example, monitoring system to some human driving vehicle, then I know there must be some privacy issues, but uh, it can really help some autonomous, drive, uh, autonomous vehicle to compete with the human driven vehicle. And maybe we should I'm not sure we should develop some technology to help people to follow the rule. Do you have any comment on this? Okay. Anyone in the panel wants to give their views? No? Anyone in the audience? Or <laughs> Ralph? Well, I can, I can try. Um, I think there are there are two ways uh, for for sort of invoking correct driving behavior. One is, and that's what we're doing, teaching, right? I mean, teach people how to drive well. That's what it's for. And then they get a license 
yeah, because they learned how to drive well. Uh, and if they tend to forget, uh, then there is enforcement. Um, and so far, I think for most of the countries that we've seen, um, that's been okay for most of us. If it wouldn't, uh, then uh, we would use the political system, I guess, uh, which so far I don't think is broken on that front, uh, to uh, mediate for that effect. Um, if then eventually, and that comes to the first question, um, it turns out that the general political consensus is that through automation, certain positive effects can be generated, uh, then it would require political consensus to install that of that sort. Um, and I would not exclude that that is going to happen, uh, but it's going to take a long time and it's going to take uh, um, a lot of visibility of this technology beyond this community working on it uh, to, uh, to make those values visible. Um, as far as how to make them visible, I think we have a good tradition of doing that. I mean, um, Dario, I guess it was, uh, this morning showed you some examples on his last slide uh, of typical calculations that we do for any sort of safety system that we deploy, and that is that we run uh, either in retrospect or with simulation data in advance from all the accident recordings that we have on what are, for example, the accidents that we could have avoided, what kind of fatalities could have been avoided, what kind of casualties could have been avoided. Um, and that would be a way also for certain autonomous functions to make the case for them. But that is something to come and that is something that I think will require uh, a broader societal discussion, I guess. Okay, even though we are a little bit out of a schedule, uh, there's a last question on my side that I would like to, to, to ask, to pose, just to think about it. Regarding the business model, I mean, uh, there are several unpredictable technological risks. Uh, future autonomous, ve autonomous vehicles, uh, driverless vehicles, or uh, partially uh, autonomous vehicles will very heavily rely on GPS data in our systems. So do you foresee a change in the business model or an evolution of the business model? Please don't tell any secret from your company. Uh, in terms of uh, some of OEM or other uh, stakeholders or technology providers like Google or others becoming a GPS data provider? It's a, a, I think, an interesting question. So, uh, Chris or Ralph, what is, what is your vision on this? I'll let Chris go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, I think the question was, is there a, a new business model in providing yeah. data for self-driving vehicles and whatnot? Yeah, extend the business model to providing GPS data uh, in order to assure the availability of the data. I, 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 yes, I imagine there is a business model there. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not our business model as of today. Um, but no, I, I think that there, you know, we, we talked earlier about the vehicles learning um, and being able to uh, uh, accumulate the knowledge from many vehicles on the road and bring that together. You could imagine that being a service, uh, and I'm making this up as I'm talking here, uh, where, where you know, we, we have some kind of collaborative agreement where we collect the data from all of the vehicles, no matter whose fleet it is, uh, bring it together and then allow you know, all the vehicles on, you know, effectively on the planet to, to have that composite experience. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about with self-driving vehicles is that we will be able to provide a a driver for people who use them that has more lifetime driving experience than a person ever conceivably could. Uh, and this kind of service would be a way to amplify that potentially. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. There is certainly one dramatically new element in this, and that's, this is that the data and data provisioning to the vehicle, uh, whether just in form of data or aggregate knowledge, however you want to call it, I don't think it's sort of, uh, of there, there is a smooth transition between these two things. Uh, that is going to be a new element uh, and a new business uh, in this entire domain. Um, as far as, as the traditional mobility products are concerned, we're already r right now seeing, of course, uh, still a, a car business which is alive and well, at least for many OEMs. Um, and that is going to continue, and it's going to continue because we'll be adding new and exciting features to our vehicles that people will want. And uh, I think that is at the core of this. It's this technology does not go out there because we are able to do it, but it goes out there because 
people are actually now wanting to have that because they feel that there are certain driving situations where they do not want to chauffeur their vehicle by themselves. Uh, and those are typical of the situations where um, you are bored or where, where, the, where the driving situation is not, not particularly exciting uh, sometimes on your commute to work or if you're stuck in a traffic jam and these kinds of situations. So people are asking us uh, to provide them with some features and so we'll give them those innovations and they will continue to buy cars. That's one element of it. And then the other element uh, goes into, into more mobility services or so where, where, where people do not own cars but where people have access to cars. And, and that is sort of something that um, over the past couple of years, not more than three years I'd say on a big scale, um, has really grown into um, a good business also for, for car manufacturers. And actually many of the car manufacturers have, have created their own um, sort of car sharing businesses uh, providing that mobility, and of course, uh, on that front, if we ever get there, uh, I can think of many applications of autonomous uh, technology, be it from bringing the cars to where they should be to taking the cars away from where they should not be, but that's going to take some time because then we take the driver out of it completely, and as I initially said, that is perhaps not well, what we'll be doing in the first place. Okay, maybe time for a final question for the, from the audience here. My name is Horst, my name is Horst Wede. Uh, Meanwhile, you have brought out, uh, up lots of hot issues uh, and challenging issues, like the, like the four-way four crossroad and uh, no sign in four cars arriving there what to do about uh, making one of the drivers more aggressive than the other ones. Uh, and see, uh, I think I want a kind of comment. Uh, I think that uh, such a solution, that whatever it would be, would be terribly expensive, technologically speaking. That's one thing. And as an example, uh, I mean, I love all Italians and also the driving style. Uh, but if you, have, if you have some experience in driving in Naples and Palermo be up, uh, behind you, then you see that all the aggression that they, they bring up, come up with uh, is compensated by an unbelievable amount of cautious, caution that they are able to, to exert themselves uh, at times. So if you want to kind of map that or map that into a technical uh, automation of, of services, uh, it costs you, it costs much, such expensive on the one hand. And on the other hand, that is the uh, same, uh, same kind of comment. Uh, I heard the tune in many of your comments now about uh, harmonizing the traffic uh, through, uh, through automation, which is, which is a valuable thing. And I have been uh, lived for quite a while in the States and I live in Europe now. Uh, as a result, of course, you are, I'm aware of the fact that uh, if you think of harmonizing the traffic, the U.S. traffic is much closer to that than any place in Europe. At the same time, uh, it also turns out that therefore the acceptance rate for any automation, car automation, would be possibly much higher and more immediate than here in Europe, Ex uh, let alone that we have to discuss the, the the money that you would have to spend on it anyway. So I think harmonization is, uh, is then a very good principle to, to, uh, to, to, come to allow for automation that can be, that can be afforded. Okay, thanks for your comment. Maybe uh, Rafa and we finish, okay? All right. Okay. Uh, yes, I have a more technical question. Uh, one person reminded me that very recently, it's actually Miguel Angel, that uh, there is the, the rule of 20, 80 percent, it was Pareto's rule, was it right? Yeah. And uh, it, that is that it takes around 20 percent of the four to get 80 percent of, of, of the performance. The, the Pareto's principle. Pareto's principle, yeah. So my point is, at which point are we now in autonomous driving? We are, we are already making it in the difficult side. We are still in the easy side that we can grow fast. How do you think? 
Okay, I will say some names in case you don't want to answer. Maybe Alberto, Cristo would be interested. <laughs> <laughs> Let you go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, to give absolute percentages are very difficult. Um, it, to, 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 um, I, I would say that if we, we are at, at a point where if we wanted to um, deploy autonomous driving in restricted situations and were willing to, um, to, con to attribute resources to that, we would be able to deploy very fast. Like I, I, I strongly believe we would be able to um, deploy a separated lane on our highways extremely soon, like in, uh, let's say in five years. Um, have automated driving on one lane, which is separated for other, reserved just for automated vehicles that, that would run on this road and there might be infrastructural aid for that. If you think about, on the other side, automated driving in public traffic, um, mixed traffic, um, which is, as we um, learn, quite expensive, that, um, quite um, difficult, um, then I think we're still a long way um, away and it's difficult to, to judge the percentages because we don't know what is actually missing. Like we learned in the last years that that map assisted driving can really help a lot and brings us, brought us forward um, in unprecedented um, portion and I hope that we'll um, see some more breakthroughs like that and um, approach automated driving. As I said, well, to, to give you a number my, my best guess would be 2030, we have some automated vehicles. But it's a rough guess. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I think I totally agree with, with Christo. And I would like to um, mention that when we, when we talk about vehicles, we usually talk about uh, cars. Uh, but there are many other vehicles around that could really benefit from this kind of technology. And I can give you a little bit about, uh, you know, but what we are doing right now, actually, we are trying to leverage our experience and, and, and use our experience into other domains, like, uh, uh, for example, it was mentioned the mining domain, agricultural domain. So we're now moving into that. And I'm, I'm sure that, I mean, we are very, very close to the, to the real automation in, in, in you know, smaller areas, um, more uh, familiar, uh, I would not say uh, easier, but more familiar uh, to what you know and what you can map. Uh, there are no bicycles, no, no pedestrians around. So we are, we are much closer to that. So I wouldn't repeat what, what Christoph said, um, but yeah, there are other domains in which this technology can be really uh, leveraged. Okay, thanks for your comments, thanks for the questions. I think uh, it's time to, to start closing the, the panel discussion. Uh, we are almost 20 minutes late, I'm fully aware of that, but I think uh, one hour for talking about this interesting topic is uh, very little, especially when we uh, have been able to gather all these people together, which is not useful and easy. So I'm very thankful to, to the five of you for that. And uh, I want to also uh, thank your patience and uh, your uh, attendance to the panel discussion. Let me just summarize according to what I've heard on the table, the major issues, only the major issues. Okay, it seems that it's very difficult to talk about a time horizon to have fully autonomous uh, vehicles on the road. And uh, uh, it seems to be clear that there will be a gradual rollout from where we are with more work needed on human-machine interactions and automated functions, more work uh, on uh, decision-making, robustness is another issue, and a seen understanding, maybe by including vision in the more advanced driverless vehicles. All right, uh, cooperative uh, technology seems to be another factor, another ingredient uh, necessary in the mix in order to ease the situation. And finally, insurance and liability are still a problem, an obstacle, but it seems that partial exemptions might be the way to get around that problem. All right, uh, I think it has been a very interesting uh, hour and 20 minutes. Uh, it has been a pleasure to listen to you and to, to the audience. So this is all on our side. Uh, with this and these conclusions, we uh, close the panel discussion. We thank you uh, again for your attendance, and I hope to see you this evening in the Galadinar in Hotel Parador. Okay, thank you. <laughs>